Hey, good morning, everyone. Josh with Severe Weather. Happy Tuesday to you. Thanks for those of you that are patient with me while I traveled over the weekend, needed a little bit of time to recharge and celebrate our 10th anniversary. And now it's back to business here. And the tropics are pretty busy um, in all basins. So despite the fact that we're in the second half of October, we're not seeing any signs of things letting up. It's kind of a red October and uh, not, of course, joking about um, the actual story there, but red meaning that we've got three areas of interest, all of which could play into our weather here, especially these two in the Pacific, for those of us here in the United States. Um, the area of greatest concern right now expected to form off the Mexican coast, likely to become Tropical Storm Norma and potentially a hurricane, and that could be a threat to land here with its moisture heading into the south central United States as we get later into next week. Behind that, another area to watch that has a decent chance of becoming the next storm, which would be Otis. And in the Atlantic, we've been tracking Invest 94L for a few days now. Um, what could be potentially our last named system coming from the African main development region origin. Um, we call this the MDR main development region. And that could be a threat still here to the Leeward Islands as we get towards uh, Thursday night, Friday, and early into the weekend before turning away and no threat to the United States and probably no threat to Bermuda. Uh, first, I wanna show you guys the Atlantic Basin and look how warm things still are across almost all the entire Atlantic, except to the south and east of New England where we do have some cooler than average water temperatures. Now, the fact that much of the basin is warm could come into play this winter, especially here over Atlantic Canada, we could have several coastal lows, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna have major snowstorms for the East Coast or the Southeast. In fact, the warmer waters could mean more rain, but it's still a ways off. Um, we really need to see a strong El Nino to uh, have a very active Southern track, which would bring uh, what we call Southeaster, Southeaster storms that track up the East Coast and bring enough cold air down into them to bring wintry weather. I think when you get back into the mountains and into the Appalachian region, that is definitely going to be the case. More snow than last winter. The coastal plain, I'm not yet sold on it being a huge winter. I think it'll be cooler than last winter, but I'm not necessarily sold on this being an extremely snowy winter in places like the Carolinas or the Mid-Atlantic or even the East Coast into New England. Now, El Nino has been pretty much holding steady just above a degree above the average here for the last three months, not showing signs, signs of strengthening at this point. And if you look at the models, they do show a moderately strong El Nino still, but we're kind of almost getting to the peak, where as we head later into the winter, we're going to see kind of a switch back to a more neutral phase. And by next summer, there is a chance on some of our models that we could be heading towards a La Nina again. With the waters as warm as they are now, this is something of great concern as we head into next year's hurricane season in the Atlantic. It could mean more storms, and maybe it doesn't mean more storms, but it could mean more impacts to the United States. So we've got a ways before that is gonna become a reality, but something that I'm certainly watching for you guys in the future. And you can see uh, none of our uh, climate forecast system ensemble members are showing this becoming a super El Nino. I know a lot of people have been talking about that for a long time. I've never jumped on that bandwagon. I think it's really, in my, in my opinion, a little bit too risky to try and forecast something that extreme. I mean, can something extreme happen? Absolutely. I mean, you guys have seen how the weather's been here in your lifetime, but um, the fact that we're kind of at a moderate, kind of a holding pattern El Nino, um, and we still have very warm waters. Obviously, it's going to be some concern as we head towards next hurricane season. So that is in the future. Let's look at the shorter term. In the Atlantic, uh, we still have an area that is likely to become a depression or storm by the end of the week. A 50% chance between now and Thursday morning, it gets the next depression status and then tropical storm status. The next name on the list is Tammy. Yes, we are on the T storm. That would be our 20th storm of the season, well above the average of 13. Uh, there is a high chance, 80%, uh, that it becomes a named system by the time it's near or just to the north and east of the Leeward Islands. And that is the only system in the Pacific or in the Atlantic that we're really tracking. The Pacific is actually going to be busier. And I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Uh, we'll get to the United States later on and talk about um, what could be a significant storm that's now moving into the Western U.S., by the end of the week and weekend in the East Coast, shocker, right? Uh, in the Pacific though, we've got a system that is likely becoming our next depression here. And the next name on the list would be Norma. So the Pacific is behind the Atlantic on named storms this season. And there's an area to watch after that as well. Um, the, fo the following name would be Otis. 
Here's a look closer to the U.S. You can see very stable, cool air coming over the warmer waters of the Gulf. That's what's causing all this low stratus here over the central Gulf. So obviously nothing to worry about here. We do have a boundary that's stretching from the northwestern Caribbean, from basically Honduras, right up through the Bahamas and Cuba, some heavier showers and storms over the southeastern Bahamas and over southeastern Cuba, including Guantanamo this morning. And we do have very low amounts of convection over the rest of the Caribbean, which has been the case for most of this season. Really, if something is gonna form around here, I think it's possible. I still think we could see something in here, but I think the better chance for organization is gonna end up on the Pacific side of Central America as we're heading into kind of a phase that favors that. The Eastern Atlantic, I think, is pretty much done after this system. I mean, we could see another wave or two come off, but I think the development chances are pretty slim. You can see a lot of dry, stable air in place here over the Cape Verde Islands, right behind our disturbance here. And I don't see that changing for the time being. Now, this is Invest 94L. And uh, you can see that there is some westerly, southwesterly wind shear. You see kind of these higher clouds coming off of South America. Uh, those are going over the top. So we do have some for thunderstorm organization, but we don't yet really have a closed off tight circulation. You can kind of make out a little bit of a spin over here around 45 west and around nine north, but it is just too broad at this point uh, for this system to be a named system. It's got a ways to go before we get to that point. It could happen more quickly tomorrow and especially on Thursday as wind shear starts to relax. Uh, but every time the model shows something like that happening, uh, it runs into kind of another roadblock and this system is taking its time, but it very well could organize before the end of the week. Uh, here is a look at our European ensemble forecast. The likelihood of this becoming a tropical depression is pretty high over the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and then obviously we get farther into the future and that certainty level drops off as you would expect. Uh, there's also a pretty decent non-tropical storm heading into northwestern Spain and Portugal. That'll eventually head towards the British Isles, but not anything tropical. And then you see kind of the Pacific side of things is getting a little bit busier. Um, interestingly, the European ensemble shows something low of latitude that may try to briefly spin up. I don't think it survives if it does. But as we get into next week, things are quieter across the Atlantic Basin overall, but we're still going to keep an eye on things here on the tail end of our boundary. Just a 20% chance north of Honduras and east of Belize for something later in the season to form. Generally speaking, though, the Pacific is wh where most of the action is going to be. And if we take a look here at the European ensembles from weathernerds.com, you see uh, very clearly this is our main feature in the Atlantic. And there are some ensemble members that go into the Northeast Caribbean, but the majority of the stronger solutions come around this high pressure region and show development into a tropical storm and maybe even a hurricane, but it's pulling away from uh, Bermuda at this point. So you can see nothing really going right at Bermuda. Everything turns away if it does develop. Everything else is pretty weak and kind of fades in here like we saw with Philippe. We are keeping an eye on things in the Western Caribbean right now. I still think it's possible, but I don't see there being a threat in the near term. Something we're gonna have to keep an eye on here in the longer term. And then the Pacific is gonna be busier uh, certainly than the Atlantic as we get into the final uh, days here of October. Here's a look at the operational GFS model and it shows a low latitude system here. It's actually got it developing into a tropical storm awfully far south uh, as we get to tomorrow night and early on Thursday. But as it's developing faster than the ensembles, it actually has it turning more along this high pressure region. And it's kind of a near miss here uh, for the Leeward Islands. It only keeps about 300 miles offshore. So it develops down in here and turns very quickly northwest. Do I think that's gonna happen? Um, I don't think it's the likeliest solution. I think this is gonna take longer to get going based on trends that I've been monitoring. And as a result, it's probably gonna get closer to the islands than what the GFS indicates. Um, it's gonna curve around, go well east of Bermuda and probably become extra tropical and merge with a front by the middle of next week behind it. We just don't really see anything of immediate concern as we get to the end of the month of October. Pressures are a little bit lower here. Um, we do have disturbances to keep an eye on in the Caribbean that could mean more, uh, more moisture and certainly more rainfall. Uh, here's a look at the uh, GFS from Earl. Actually, let me speed this up a little bit um, or move it into the future. There we go. And you can see um, this system has been struggling for two reasons. One, there's been an upper level low out ahead of it, a weak inflection here. And that's uh, about a day and a half ahead of 94L. And that's causing some wind shear to go up and over the storm, keeping it from tightening up very quickly. Uh, the other thing is there's a lot of dry air to the north and west of the circulation, kind of keeping it from growing on the western side. So typical El Nino here, where we see stronger than average high pressure systems in the Atlantic uh, because of the warmer waters. And as a result, we've got more dry air that is 
it's got to fight. And that's why we haven't seen things come into the Caribbean very much this season or come up into the uh, Bahamas or even on the southeast coast, other than systems that have formed very quickly close to the coast. Now, as we get on into the future here, um, moving along, we can see uh, this upper level load is going to zip away north of Puerto Rico here by tomorrow night and early Thursday, allowing a window for some possible development. There's still dry air in the way, but you can see the upper low actually brings some additional moisture into the face of this system. And as a result, uh, while it is going to be mostly east centered, you can see all the dark greens are east of the center while, while we have these browner colors, which indicate drier air to the west of it. Uh, there is enough of an envelope for this thing to develop. I just don't know if the GFS is going to be right here. It seems to be a little bit aggressive, which interestingly, last week, it was the last model to the table here where the Canadian and then the European showed development. Finally, the GFS woke up and said, oh yeah, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon. Well, now it's the stronger of the models. So again, a lot of instability with this operational model. That's why I start losing trust and faith in it after we get past a few days. You can see, though, it's turning away. The air mass behind it is a lot drier than we see kind of a hybrid system forming. And unfortunately, in the islands, if, if even if we don't get this system, uh, we're going to see a pretty wet pattern heading into the end of the month of October around Halloween here in the U.S., around the 30th and 31st. So people who are planning a cruise down to these islands, maybe getting in on some lower rates, uh, maybe running into a, a significant amount of rain and, and wet weather towards the end of the month of October and beginning of November, even if nothing tropical develops, which I think would probably be the case. Uh, taking a look here at the uh, Canadian model, this is kind of more of a in-between model. It's coming a little bit farther north, a little bit weaker, develops it into a tropical storm by Thursday, and then potentially close to hurricane strength Friday as it comes fairly close here to the Leeward Islands. You can see it doesn't quite make landfall. It kind of scrapes these islands, which obviously is not going to be great, but we could see tropical storm conditions as soon as early Friday morning if this model ends up being correct. So this system may not even get a name or even become a depression until Thursday, Thursday night, but we may have a potential tropical cyclone with tropical storm watches before that even happens based on the time frame we're looking at if this does try to develop kind of last minute as it comes close to the islands. So that's something I would be on the lookout for. I don't think Puerto Rico is going to have issues with this. The U.S. Uh, Virgin Islands may keep an eye on it. British Virgin Islands may be a better shot, but I'm thinking mainly the Leeward Islands would have to be most concerned with this. It is going to make a right turn well to the southeast of Bermuda later this weekend and should be out of our hair by the time we get into next Monday and Tuesday. That's pretty much a look here at the GFS and the European. Uh, I wanted to show you real quick. The European, um, which was one of the earlier models to adopt this thing, strengthening has backed off and it doesn't think it really develops at all. I don't know if that's gonna be right. Uh, if it does, we're, if it does try to do something, we are gonna look at some moisture in place here by Friday across the Lesser Antilles, then pulling away quickly by Sunday morning. So the Euro says this isn't gonna happen. It does indicate though that things are gonna be a little bit more active here near Puerto Rico and on up to the east of Bermuda late next week. So that is what we'll be watching. These tropical models I show you, the spaghetti plots, um, the red one is climatology. That is not a model itself. It's just what you might expect. Everything else says it's close to, over, or just east of the islands here in about 96 hours, which would be Friday morning. Um, at that point, the storm is making a right term. It's gonna stay well east of Puerto Rico and Hispaniola and should be a fish storm by the time it gets out over the central Atlantic this weekend. Uh, ensembles, this is the Canadian. It's probably the closest here to the islands. If you look at the European, uh, you can see it's weaker. Um, so it's also kind of close, but the ensemble or the ensembles that try to form it um, that are stronger are turning it away. And then the GFS ensemble, which is the one I've been watching most closely, has been trending a bit more to the right. It's also developing it stronger than the others. So uh, if this system is overachieving, which I don't think it will be, then I can see how this plays out. If it's a little weaker, such as what the Canadian, the European show, it could be a little bit more of a threat to the lesser Antilles. So that's what I'll be watching for you guys. Intensity forecasts, right now we don't even have a depression. We may get to that point Wednesday morning, more likely Thursday morning. And uh, all the ensembles and all of the tropical models for the most part, show that this has the potential to be a tropical storm before the end of Thursday, and maybe a stronger tropical storm or even a hurricane by Friday as it makes its closest approach to the islands. Um, I don't think there's a lot of skill in forecasting something that hasn't yet formed. I do my very best to predict that, but I'll be honest with you guys, um, there's a lot of spread here once we get past tonight and tomorrow morning. So until we see some development here, this could very much change. 
The trend shows that it will develop, but and there's a high chance of that happening, but the spread is very large at this point. So there's still a lot that can change. On the Pacific side of things, red October here, we got two potential systems. This first one, I think, is already getting very close to that level now. Uh, EP90, it's an invest uh, likely to become a depression or even a storm here before the end of the day. The next name on the list is Norma. And this does look like a threat to land and maybe a future impact in the South Central United States next week. Um, we saw this with Lydia a week ago where the system came actually way out to here, turned around and came back and hit Mexico near this bend here near Puerto Vallarta. This one, I think, makes a less of an, an extreme turn but it looks like more of a threat to Cabo San Lucas, the lower Baja, the lower Gulf of California, eventually comes into Northwestern Mexico here as a dying system. And I do think it has hurricane potential. The system behind it hasn't really even formed yet. It likely does in the next couple of days as it moves off the coast of Guatemala and El Salvador. It's gonna be in a pretty favorable spot here for development. And in the next seven days, we see a 70% chance of development. The future name would be Otis, my man, um, he loves us, except if you're on the Mexican Riviera, he may not love you. We'll see, though, about that. You can see two separate areas spinning here. Uh, let me get out my pen just to kind of circle things for you guys to follow along here at home. Uh, this system right here, 90E, that already has a pretty well-defined low-level center forming on it. I don't see how this doesn't become a tropical storm before the time I do this video tomorrow morning. Uh, it's likely heading out in this direction, but then turning up in this area. And this is the area I'm watching for potential landfall here towards the weekend and early next week. This next area is just coming off the coast now. You can see there's some coastal convergence. As it gets out into here, it really has to wait for Norma to move out of the way before it tries to develop down in here. And um, with the big trough that's over the Western US likely to drive this feature in this direction, it's gonna try to pick up what I think could be Otis here, but uh, it may miss that connection. So it's possible it comes out into here but there is a chance it tries to come back here towards the Riviera as well. That's what I'll be watching for you guys here uh, in future days. Uh, here is a look closer at 90L. I don't see how this isn't a depression now. Um, I bet you by the 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern uh, time frame, we have a tropical depression advisory. Uh, the one behind it, though, has got a ways to go. Here's a look at our ensembles over the next couple of days. And you can see both systems here pretty clearly. Um, this is the European and this is Friday evening and it's already turning north. There's uh, some models that bend it back to the left briefly, so it might take longer. Other model solutions or ensemble solutions are already turning that system very quickly before the weekend. So potentially it could be impacting Cabo San Lucas as soon as Saturday morning. Although we do have some slower solutions that say it's gonna take potentially until next Monday or even Tuesday. So a bit of a spread here on the forward speed. And a lot of that is decided by if it tries to turn back to the left and holds for a day or two, or if it accelerates northward, which is also a possibility. Uh, we do have the next feature behind it. All of the ensembles show low pressure here. Uh, a lot of uncertainty on where it can go. Um, whoops, let me move that back for you guys. But you can see, obviously, uh, still some time to keep an eye on that one. That would be Otis. Uh, here's a GFS model. And it's developing the system and taking it off pretty quickly. Um, I would not be shocked if this storm tried to become another deep hurricane like we saw with Lydia. Wind shear is the one thing that might keep it from getting too deep, but you can see it's showing 950s here um, as we head on into Friday afternoon and evening, then weakening slightly as it comes up toward Cabo San Lucas. Then the GFS puts on the brakes here this weekend and turns it to the right. So it doesn't actually have landfall on Cabo San Lucas, but it does have it close enough to produce potentially hurricane conditions. Um, it should weaken by the time it very quickly moves into northwest Mexico early next week. And all that moisture is heading up into uh, Texas and the Red River Valley. And it's even got a circulation heading through Oklahoma uh, by the time we get to next Wednesday morning. Behind it, you can see it's struggling to develop the next system. Uh, the Hurricane Center has got a high chance. Uh, it's not looking at the GFS too much at this point, but I think that's certainly a possibility. Other models are kind of struggling a bit as well. It's the Canadian that really goes to town here. You see the Canadian model. Um, has a hurricane coming up west of Cabo San Lucas, making landfall Saturday afternoon, crossing the Gulf of California and much weaker by the time it makes eventual mainland landfall here past the peninsula here early Monday. Uh, but that moisture heads up into this region and here, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. It is developing our next system early next week into Tropical Storm Otis. And it's pulling it close to the Riviera, but it is not making landfall. It's kind of scraping the coast. And then it shows the next wave coming across and potentially developing into our third storm in the next two weeks. The European model, here's what it's doing here with um, what should be Norma. 
You can see it does a little bit of that cyclonic loop and then comes up and makes landfall actually on Tuesday. So the spread is pretty big still on potential landfall location and timing. Could be Saturday night, Sunday morning. If the if it takes a quicker turn, could take until Tuesday morning and Wednesday night and, and Tuesday night, Wednesday morning before eventual landfall. But either way, all the models show this getting picked up by a trough and pulled into the south central US along the periphery of a ridge of high pressure over the southeast which we should all be familiar with because that's what was here most of the summer. Uh, here's a look at the next system, potentially Otis and not yet an immediate threat to land, but something we do have to keep an eye on because the European is also showing several solutions that do try to tug it northward towards Mexico, which climatologically would be something I would believe. Uh, we have action in the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean to keep an eye on. Um, no typhoon potential for the time being, but we do have potentially a weak system that could bring some flooding to Vietnam, uh, especially northern Vietnam here in future days. We're also going to have to keep an eye on an area here east of Sri Lanka, west of Indonesia, in the Bay of Bengal that typically speaking would try to move northward uh, right through the northern part of the bay. So we have to keep an eye on that. And we have something in the Arabian Sea where the waters are super warm. Finally, something spinning up here, breaking through the ridge that's had a stranglehold on this area. So keep an eye on things in Oman and around the northern part of the Arabian Sea. We've got some time for that but something we're gonna watch here. Oops, let me move that back for you guys. Uh, the GFS model, you can see big trough bringing chilly weather to the Southeast today and tomorrow is going to eventually lift out. We're gonna see warmer temperatures by Thursday across the Eastern states, but our next system moves right on down into the Great Lakes. And that unfortunately is lining us up for another very active start of the weekend in the Eastern US. If you like rain on the weekends, this is your month for sure. If you are in the Eastern US, especially the Mid-Atlantic, the Great Lakes, Southeast Canada, New England, um, it's gonna take its time, but it is moving our direction. And um, after that moves out very slowly next week, we do have some change in the weather coming as above average temperatures surge northward. We're gonna have an ample ridge in place and also a very deep trough in place over the West. Uh, what this does is, it protects the Gulf and the East Coast from any tropical trouble early next week. It also leads to much milder temperatures. So those of you in Florida today that have to wear socks with your flip-flops will be back to t-shirt shorts and flip-flops by next week. Uh, this bigger storm system could produce some severe weather by the time it rolls out here Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, I would be watching in the plains for that, but it's still kind of far off to make any kind of hero calls at this point. Here's a look at the European model operational, and you can see here's our storm dropping down into the upper Midwest tomorrow night into Thursday. Not really a lot of storm activity, but we could see storms down here in the Tennessee Valley in the deep south Thursday night early on Friday. More of a rainmaker, especially for the Outer Banks and then right up into New England and back here across the Great Lakes. It's going to be kind of kind of a miserable start to the weekend again, and a lot of rain for eastern New England Saturday night and Sunday. Uh, cool and unsettled, maybe some mountain snows as we get into Sunday morning as well over the Blue Ridge mountain range. Uh, after that, things do gradually warm back up. Next Wednesday should be above average. Here you can see our hurricane coming up as a remnant low in the West Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. And Wednesday and Thursday look to be pretty active here with severe weather possible, as well as an intrusion of colder air behind this, which could bring a pretty significant snowstorm to the Prairie Provinces, Montana, and the Colorado and Utah Mountains as well as northeastern Oregon. So cooler and more unsettled in the West as we get a taste of some winter here uh, in about seven to eight days. Uh, let me zoom this back. Sorry, guys, I was looking ahead. Uh, here's a look at thunderstorm chances. Pretty low, but we could see lightning tomorrow over parts of southeast Minnesota and Iowa and Wisconsin. Um, then we could see some across the lower Tennessee Valley in the deep south Thursday night and especially on Friday. Nothing severe, I don't think, but maybe some heavy rain over parts of Georgia and northern Florida. As we get to the weekend, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, thunderstorm chances are pretty low, but we could see some uh, trying to form around the Delmarva and as well as over eastern New England as this moisture surges up. Next week, though, you can see things are going to get busier pretty quickly here across the southwest over western Mexico and then surging northward into the plains and upper Midwest by Wednesday and Thursday of next week. That should be a pretty dynamic storm, but we've got some time to watch it. Rain through early next week is going to be pretty significant over the East Coast, especially over northern and eastern New England, upstate New York, over parts of Quebec, over eastern Ontario, and especially the Maritimes of Canada, which I'm not showing you because this is the Weather Prediction Center forecast. They are based in the U.S., uh, and you can see there could be some significant rain as well over uh, southeastern Florida, maybe up to an inch south of Miami, heavier amounts over the uh, Bahamas, potentially three or four inches 
uh, near the uh, down eastern part of North Carolina, Atlantic Beach, Emerald Isle, Cape Hatteras, one to two inches over Maine. Most of this falling Saturday night and Sunday, and it rains in Maine, apparently. Uh, VisitMaine.com seems to be busy when it comes to storms this year. Not a tropical system, but certainly one that's going to produce some locally heavier amounts of rain with it. Uh, Mount Washington heavy rain might start out as snow and ice. It's just going to be a really ugly weekend if you're trying to do leaf peeping in New England. Uh, and unfortunately, even all the way down to the Smokies and Blue Ridge, not looking great this weekend. So you got a couple days of decent weather here. Um, follow my friend Mitch West. He was up in the mountains yesterday with his family. Got to see beautiful foliage and high elevation snow. And it looks like they had a great time. I would love to get out there, but I just don't have that time right now. Uh, but that snow winds down, they should warm up and we should see some beautiful fall color still for the next few days over the Western Carolinas, over Virginia, over West Virginia in the middle elevations. So a uh, very nice weekend shaping up uh, in the plains, very nasty in the east. And we are gonna see uh, a drier air by early next week, pushing eastward into the Southeast, followed by a warm up next week. Thank you all so much for your time today. I hope you have a blessed day. Uh, if you did enjoy this video, please consider becoming a subscriber. Um, I know many of you have, and I very much appreciate you all. We do have a membership channel, $9.99 a month. If you want to support me, you don't have to. I'm not begging for your money, but it would help support me. And those are the folks that I'm going to turn to first that have weather questions for me. I don't have a lot of time. I do work a full-time job. This is on the side right now. Uh, but um, in my limited time, I would love to help those folks out as much as possible with any forecasting requests that they have. Everyone else, I appreciate it. I mean, you all obviously mean a lot to me. And I really appreciate being able to have an audience to share what matters most to me. Not the weather, honestly. What matters most to me is my God and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, he provides me joy. He provides me with assurance that my future is taken care of. And uh, I just wanted to share that word with you all. Certainly not a preacher, certainly uh, not even much of an evangelist, but somebody who appreciates what's been done for me and wants to give that gift to you as well. And I want to read a quick passage because I think this rings really true for me as somebody who about 10 years ago was still gambling with my future, uh, did not know what was going to happen next. I kind of feared death. I feared just being in a dismal state. But uh, the window opened for me to study with Christian folks, to be around people of joy, people with, with an eternal future. And I became a Christian uh, at the end of March on Easter Sunday, uh, 2013. It's been over 10 years now that I've been a Christian. It's taken me a lot longer to kind of get out of the comfort zone and share with other people. But what I see with people, um, even Christians, but people who don't have a certain future, who are gambling with eternity, um, that they let their past ruin their future. And what I mean by that is they don't, they don't see, they, they, they hold on to baggage, they hold on to things for the rest of their lives. What happened in the past is the past. You can't go and change the past, but you very much can change your future. Paul tells the church of Corinthians in his second letter, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, the Lord doesn't have to turn us into new people, but because he put his son on the cross to die for us because he so loved the world. We can become new creations in him through Jesus Christ. We are reconciled. Our sins are washed away. We are reconciled with God. And when it's time to answer to him, when our time on earth is up, those of us who accept Jesus as our savior are given that fresh eternal life. And that is the gift that I didn't know I was going to receive, but I'm glad that I did. Um, you know, I chatted with somebody in my cycle class yesterday um, about, you know, what I do with my life. And he's like, man, I've, I've been hurt so many times. I just, uh, I, I'm not atheist, but I'm agnostic. I just don't, I don't believe there's anything out there. I've just been hurt so many times. And you know what? I said, that's okay, man. I, I totally get it. I've been hurt so many times by people who are of faith, people who weren't. Uh, the point is I was done gambling with my future. I wanted to, to live eternally. And man, I'm just going to pray for you because I don't want to pressure you into believing what I believe. I don't think that's right, but I don't think prayer could hurt. And he's like, no, I agree. I appreciate you thinking of me. And that's, that's just something I just wanted to share with you all because it's important to me. Uh, having said that, no matter what your beliefs are, I want to pray for you. If you have any prayer requests, uh, I am happy to, to take some time out of my day and pray for you and your family because it's important to me to do so. Um, sharing the weather is important, but sharing my faith is equally important and caring for other people is why I do what I do. 
If you want to pray for me too, man, I would really appreciate that. So anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful Tuesday and we'll chat again tomorrow morning. Have a blessed day. See you then.